I super recognize as effectively a, a people, perhaps in the top 1% of the population, who have exceptionally good face recognition abilities. Um, uh, sort of from slightly more than a fleeting glimpse, perhaps, they can sometimes recognize people who they've never met previously, sometimes months or even years later. So this is a, 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 an amazingly useful source of identification evidence for police forcing for police forces because obviously these people can recognize suspects perhaps that they've arrested before in cctv evidence josh thank you for coming on my show the mike sarasut show really excited to have you with us um i first came to know about super recognizers when i accidentally stumbled upon your website and uh, applied for it. My partner applied for it. We went through a few tests. We felt uh, superhuman because we were like, oh, you're in the top whatever percentile. And we were like, yes, this is brilliant. We knew we always had it in us. And, uh, you know, from there on, we went on to, uh, I think my partner, we went on to come to uh, one of your research uh, facilities, did a test. Um, and I wanted to, but I couldn't find time. So I approached you again and saying so if, if that's possible but i'd love to do that whenever in the future you're having that but all in all it's such a fascinating field of research so over to you who you are and who is a super recognizer okay uh, well I, i'm josh davis i'm a, a professor of applied psychology at the university of greenwich and yeah i i, I study sort of eyewitness identification and policing and in particular super recognizers and so super recognizers effectively are, are people perhaps in the top one percent of the population who have exceptionally good face recognition abilities um uh, sort of from slightly more than a fleeting glimpse perhaps they can sometimes recognize people who they've never met previously sometimes months or even years later so this is a, a, a an amazingly useful source of identification evidence for police forcing for police forces because obviously these people can recognize suspects perhaps that they've arrested before in cctv evidence so i have a sort of joint research program one side is to try to understand the science behind these people and we know there's genetic influences going on we know there is experience with faces going on but on the other side is how can we apply this scientific evidence to police forces security industry and others to sort of reach sort of high standards of um, evidence potentially for court uh, and and also, you know, what else can we use super recognizers for? That's amazing. That's amazing. So, from a super rec recognizer point of view, it it you know, I know you've also consulted, uh, uh, you know, people who write science fiction, and uh, right. you know, so from your point of view, um, what are the applications of something like this in a normal society? Well, in normal society say outside policing the, the the real skills are if anybody works in a job where they have infrequent uh, exposure to sort of unfamiliar people that they sort of meet on an irregular basis to be able to recognize those people time and time again is a real skill very useful for almost any, any industry really um sales for instance it's it's just bumping into someone and going ah oh, haven't seen you for a couple of years, how are you? Knowing their name, knowing something about them actually makes feel, people feel quite important. So you can imagine, even though most of my research is on policing and how can we use these people to detect criminals, actually there's a, a vast number of other uses that super recognizers may have in, in, in all sorts of workplaces. Um, so, I mean, my, my, the example I always give is the sort of maitre d' at uh, a, a, a nice restaurant where they'll get occasional B and C list stars wandering in. And to be able to remember those names are absolutely essential to keep that flow of customers coming on, coming in who will probably put, put the post up on, on social media. Ah, oh, whoever it is, 
met me again. I hadn't seen him for six months and he recognised me. So you can imagine that business is already going to be thriving with their, uh, with their positive reviews. That's very interesting you say that. Um, there is a uh, cafe owner, Mortimer Cafe in Fitzrovia, uh, where our office is. And uh, uh, Max, the owner, literally, I can see he does it. I don't know if he does it intentionally, uh, but he is so good. And uh, once we hired a few more people, he instantly, within the second or third visit, was sort of dropping their names. Hey, how you doing? Um, you know, what can I get you? Last time you took that, you won the same. And I was like, this is, this is very fascinating just to watch that and how then they became repeat customers of his because they felt more comfortable going to him. Um, so that familiarity kicked in, which is interesting. How about um, a person like myself? So when I did your tests, which what was interesting is um, it was all visual aid, especially the online ones. And I, I think maybe the ones we do in the uh, in the test facility will be different slightly maybe but um, I felt very comfortable because I'm very visual I'm slightly dyslexic uh, but names tend to be very difficult for me um, but faces to the point that if somebody's earlobe is slightly different or if they are wearing a different nail polish or literally you know it's it's it, it, it is crazy because sometimes I've had myself say things to very senior people men and women as clients are uh, saying, oh, you, oh, that, that, that's a new scarf, haven't you? you? You've never seen it before that, or that's a new haircut, or, you know, you did something with your, you know, ex and then it's just, and so then you feel a bit embarrassed. <laughs> You're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but it's just the brain kind of going, whoo, you know, it gets so excited. But names are difficult for me. So is, uh, is there a technique that uh, people like us or people in business can use with names? if they're good with faces or the other way around, they might be good with names and... Yeah, well, well with super recognizers in general, we find that they recognize a, a sort of proportionally about the same number of names as everybody else. The thing is, they tend to recognize more faces in the yeah. first place. So they also recognize more names just by, by design. But it's not true of all. Some are absolutely terrible at recognizing names. I mean, there are sort of techniques that people have been using from year dot, I think, where you sort of use mind maps to try to link someone's name to some object or some place or something like that. And I mean, I'm, I must admit, I, I've tried that sort of thing and it hasn't worked. But what's quite interesting is that world champion super memorizers as they call them who can do that type of thing actually the, the, there were two world champions who were whose face recognition ability was tested and they were just average so what we know about face recognition and it seems to be a very specific skill that doesn't necessarily transfer to to other skills generally super recognizers are better at most visual recognition tasks but as I said, that's, that is generalizing. And some of them, of course, may be specialists in, I mean, at the moment we're looking at bird recognition and we're interested in a crossover there. So some obviously bird uh, twitchers are absolutely amazing at recognizing birds. If they're a super recognizer as well, they can do that. But it doesn't mean that it transfers to any other skill whatsoever. Um, we're, we're trying to understand, this is what I said, some of it's about um, working with organizations to improve what they're doing but other is trying to understand what's sort of going on in the brain as well and this is sort of one of the the patterns so yes these sort of mind mapping type things might help you pretend names but i must admit i'm rubbish at names. <laughs> do, do you know a couple of things actually come to mind whilst be listening to you was um one of them was using it in um tracking new habitable planets and stars and uh, you know that that could be a quite an interesting thing um and uh, I don't know if you guys have sort of done any kind of that research because get super <laughs> not, recognizers to... <laughs> not that one, no. <laughs> get super recognizers to track all the uh, you know uh, habitable planets because NASA puts out all this free uh, citizen data, and that'd be quite interesting to uh, to to use them. For. Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I do wonder what, from what you're sort of suggesting is I, when I the reason we're testing 
twitchers who might also be super recognizers is to see whether they actually have an enhanced ability because somehow the brain is hotwired so that they can learn faces better but maybe birds better maybe that brain is also hot work wired for other types of objects as well so that's what we're interested in so it may well be that there are some people there who develop the skills from doing exactly that you're su you're suggesting looking at nasa type images to see what information they could absorb but if their their brain is hot wired to somehow extract more information than the rest of us from those images maybe they would be the perfect people for that type of role i mean that, i'm really really hypothesizing from a very long distance from my expertise here but it, it's a possibility it's interesting because when i was doing your tests i found it very very easy to um very comfortable rather um to look at faces and then you <clears throat> in some of the exercises you had sped them up and um you changed some of the features and i was like ha ha that, that's quick you know i found that i found that but when it came to babies i found that slightly more difficult with their faces oh. um I'm, I'm actually I, I was pretty comfortable with people's hands <clears throat> as well um but what I found was more difficult with objects was when you were doing with musical instruments and um, and furniture. Um, I, I found furniture easier than instruments, but instruments, I don't know why, but it was just bizarre. Maybe it's just familiarity that I'm not very familiar with them. But it was just interesting what, what you said. That me leads me to my next question is correlations. Do you see any interesting correlations between... Uh, their habits on a day-to-day -day basis when they are actually so maybe they've eaten something you know high sugar high salt or um or, or things uh, or things like had a good night's sleep are there any correlations with any of those so it's quite hard to to run the type of study that you're suggesting uh, because therefore you have to have full control over someone's I don't know, week or something, uh, so that you, you can measure their exact amounts of sleep. You can, I mean, we, so I, I interview super, super recognizers uh, and, I, and I ask this type of question and, and there's rarely any great common pattern going on. Um, like everybody, every human, super recognizers make mistakes, super recognizers don't get a good night's sleep and probably do worse on tests. But it's very hard to measure that because you've therefore got to you've got to have tested that super recognizer before when they did get a full night's sleep and then after when they don't and it, it, it requires a certain amount of planning so i i think rather than state super recognizers um may or may not be susceptible i think we as humans are susceptible to these sort of lifestyle influences that might impact how we do any task Really, I, 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 I sort of go back to always say to police officers, well, to, to senior police officers, yes, we may identify the person with the best face recognition ability in the world, but actually they may not be able to apply that skill to the job. That's, it's, it's always a bit of a, a balance. You can't, you can't guarantee successes. What you can do is try to make conditions right so that the success can thrive. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. And, <clears throat> you know, a lot of sort of my contacts and people who listen to uh, my content tend to be senior leaders, um, CEOs, founders of companies, and, you know, all people in the field of marketing, advertising, again, senior leadership roles, budgets, restraints, and, and what have you. And all of them are always looking for hacks of trying to improve and be more efficient, uh, <clears throat> and are there any key learnings from super recognition that we can take into the world of leadership and business? Um, well, so the sort of areas that I'm interested in at the moment that probably do overlap is how can we use machine learning and a artificial intelligence? Um, because again, in the world of face recognition, of course, there are computers doing this. However, they do make mistakes uh, and allegedly they might be biased towards some ethnicities. A lot of the bias inherent in any AI system is actually 
humans have put that bias into that system. So, so one of the things we, we do with Super Recognize, for instance, is see if they're less susceptible to the bias. So you can imagine, computer says this is a match. Um, and you give, you know, humans two images um, to say, this is what the computer says, what do you think? And we do find that all humans, including super recognizers, are susceptible to that bias. Machine says yes, therefore they will be safe. But super recognizers are less susceptible to the bias. So they're not perfect, as I said from the start. So for me, this is absolutely key to the future of the workplace, because in all endeavors, we can see that AI is going to be used more and more. However, humans are always going to be the last interpreters of the information produced by AI um, in whatever circumstance it is. And therefore we need to understand the sort of cognitive um, principles behind this so that they are less susceptible to the, the biases that will be inherent in every system. That's interesting. So looking at biases inherent in every system, that's, uh, that's quite interesting um, uh, as a giveaway. So thank you for that because <laughs> I think <clears throat> oh, the more I speak to senior leaders, they've, they're, they're positive time and they're always trying to make very quick decisions and how can they uh, create uh, the best decision making scenarios for themselves. So one of the things is look at the biases and look at biases at different silos and different uh, team levels. And this is very interesting, very interesting. Uh, it's, it's one of the biases, for example, uh, you know, uh, talking about biases is um, we always thought that in this in our sales and creative sales um, sort of world, um, there were not enough sort of women coming in to the workspace. And um, that inherently we felt meant that a lot of the um, women might struggle with um, sort of putting themselves in front of CEOs and CMOs and senior individuals. And we find that that's actually not true. It, it was just a bias. It was uh, because there, there is no real fundamental training that any of them needed to get to that place. It was only a culture of uh, sort of people feeling comfortable with other types of people that they kind of get along with. Um, and we're uh, amending that um, as a company. So we, not that, you know, we can't be biased towards a certain type of gender or ethnicity when we're hiring, yeah. but we, we are more conscious and aware of the fact that just because it's a female, that um, she, she's less likely to do that sales driven role uh, is actually a bias. So we're trying to amend that ourselves. Um, yeah, that, for me, that, 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 is, that is a real positive. And I, and I feel that, so, so for the next step though, for me, is that one of the things we are trying to do in this type of research, which I must agree is a narrow focus, is you tell people you will be biased by this information and to try to reduce the bias. And actually, again, they find it hard to overcome, um, but slightly better do the super recognizers, probably because they're just better at doing the task anyway. So for me, it might be that in all these arenas, actually, it's about selection of the right person to do the right job, who is least susceptible to the type of influences that you definitely want them to avoid. So yeah, that's that I think that's that's my take home message. And I think it's cognitive psychologists and social psychologists and who else can perhaps help um, sort of leaders in the, in, you know, in, in industry or any organization to improve what they do. It's exactly. ergonomics, really. No, very true. Very true. This kind of uh, takes me into the question of um, you as an individual. So, uh, you know, and I'm always fascinated by especially those who do research and uh, do deep research. Um, and you've been doing this for quite a while now. I remember doing my super recognizer tests a few good years ago. So you definitely are passionate about this or have found passion eventually in this. So tell us a bit about your personal life and your journey and how did you come about this research? Um, yeah, well, I, I left school at 16 and I, I ended up running a, a small business, a factory, in fact, making soft drinks, which I didn't enjoy very much. So, so I went to university in my mid thirties and I did a final year project there, doing a psychology degree on the parallels between voice and face recognition, uh, a little niche little project. And, and that got me interested in this sort of whole recognizer aspect of human life. Um, 
And then I did a PhD looking at the way that CCTV evidence is used in court for identification purposes. So it sort of brought in a bit of law, sort of human rights. Uh, and so I was very interested in how psychology can help improve the criminal justice system, one, by reducing uh, miscarriages of justice where uh, innocent people have gone to prison. And quite often it was due to um, misidentifications by perfectly reliable, honest witnesses getting it wrong. And, and on the other side, how can we improve the system so that those who are guilty of a crime actually get convicted of that crime um, in court? So it, it's trying to work on this balance. And for me, the super recognizers is part of that sort of agenda of improving the system because they are less likely to identify innocent people. They are more likely to, in, to identify guilty people. So it fulfills both sides of this sort of scales of justice that we're, we're constantly trying to, to improve. So that's where, that's really my philosophical agenda for, for coming in. Uh, and, you know, you can, if you can get police forces on board and the lawyers on board it's it's a it's a powerful a powerful thing that's very interesting that's um that's that's uh, very interesting and uh, <clears throat> um i i personally was involved um sort of ages ago about eight ten years ago i think um there was a little confrontation um in a park i um, completely unprovoked um and um then the police said to me, would you, um, they will parade um, some of the folks in front of me. And they said, would you try and recognize us? I said, yeah, sure. And it's, it's, it's sad because I was very tempted to, because I have that clear face still, I can kind of have certain characteristics in my head very clearly. And um, unfortunately that didn't happen. But I, I was also partially nervous that if I go in and, and to damage someone's life, um, so to speak, um, if I wrongly identified somebody. But that's, that, that is a very interesting thing to say. And looping it back to your earlier point of biases in AI, and um, some of those biases are built in by human beings and sometimes subconsciously built in by human beings. Um, it could have been I built an AI for recruitment and I might have accidentally built in the bias towards men and women in a way um, uh, for sales roles. So it's, it's very interesting how... <clears throat> Uh, people um, and super recognizers could help. From your point of view, um, how much a role does um, popular um, sort of pop culture and fiction play in uh, making super recognizers a bit more a mainstream field of research? Um. It's very hard for me to tell, I must admit. I, 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 as you mentioned earlier, I have helped a couple of um, fiction writers with, with, with their books, um, as in, you know, they, they, you have a meeting with them, they interview me and ask me all about super recognisers and then would this character be feasible and this sort of thing? So they can, they can build up the character. So for me, that that's very interesting. I, 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 from, I think that it's results from police forces encourage other police forces. So yes, maybe they hear about it in the media, but, but also police like to boast about their successes to their next door neighbour police force. So of course, that sort of generates interest in, in that direction. And then, you know, with, with businesses, we work with identification, verification businesses in, in different areas. And of course, they're interested in the same sort of things, but the tasks that the super recognizers they employ are actually do are slightly different. So you adapt the, the tests to identify these people from those that are, I would do with police. So yes, popular culture's probably helped, but I have no idea how much. How much? No, that's fine. Um, just looking at a list of questions now, I think we've, we've kind of covered most of them. Uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> I think we, we, we will talk quickly about um, any sort of what, what are your cons what are your concerns around data privacy and um, sort of 
you know, surveillance in the society are we are being monitored a bit too much? Uh, or what are your thoughts? So, uh, well, one of the reasons I was interested in doing a, a PhD in the first place on the way that CCTV uh, images are used in court was that sort of try to partly answer that very question. Is it worth having so many cameras as we do in London uh, viewing us all the time? How, how, how often do the police actually use these images? How easy would it be for somebody else to gain access to those images to use them for whatever purposes they wish? So, so for, for my area, I mean, when I first started, the police just weren't using them. We had millions of cameras up in London and very, very few crimes. What was it? I, I seem to remember one crime per thousand cameras per annum was solved yeah. because of CCTV. I, I, I don't quote me on that because I might be slightly out, but I do think I'm right. Um, so tiny numbers, but huge numbers of cameras there. So, so that agenda for using the images just at the same time as super recognizers started, the reason that super recognizers became known in the Met was because they passed started actually dealing with the images professionally by making them available to, for police officers to see. Otherwise, they just went in a drawer and nobody ever saw crime scene images. So, so in a way, that's an improvement. I do worry about face recognition systems, the computerized systems. I don't worry about human super recognizers. In a way, we all expect our police officers to be able to recognize criminals. If they can't recognise criminals, it's slight, slightly worry. So I don't think anybody, even criminals, minds being identified by a super recogniser. However, having um, computer systems that can work 365 days a week, 24 hours a day, can match your face fairly accurately, very accurately, some of the best, um, and, and sort of say, well, you were there that day, you were there that day, you were there that day, and we know that no system is entirely secure of hacking. That means other people might have access to your information for nefarious purposes. My thoughts, though, are there are, what is it, 70 million people in the UK. You have to spare a lot of time to actually make those nefarious practices work with a population of 70 million. However, you could target individuals probably um, uh, to their detriment. So, so I do worry, but I do think actually the worries are, people's worries are, are, are greater than the reality. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, but no, but, uh, thanks for <clears throat> being transparent on that. I've always thought about it and, and it's like, hmm, okay, um, you know, how useful is it? And, uh, you know, does the the amount of good that can potentially come out of it, does it outweigh the sort of, you know, interference in, in personal data? And I think it does. At the moment, the maximum use of that is, uh, um, you know, <laughs> lane fines and, and, and sort of traffic fines and, oh, you were at the well, red light. And <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, is, that is the problem, um, that it's easy to use systems to identify number plates, for instance, so that you can do all those sort of traffic offences much harder to do them, use the systems to sort of recognise people. I, and I, I, I don't think anybody would ever complain if the police knew that there might be a terrorist going to plant a bomb in an area to use every single system that they could possibly do to protect members of the public in those circumstances. However, it's, oh, we got this system, we spend millions on it, what else can we do with it? Mm. Yeah, littering. It's, 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 suddenly it, it's, it suddenly becomes used use for something else other than its original purpose. And that's where the public perhaps should be most worried. I'm not, not sorry, saying littering shouldn't be, isn't a problem. But what I'm saying is that it, 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 it becomes easy to use in circumstances that people didn't expect the systems to be that's used. That's very interesting. No, it's interesting you talk about terrorism uh, as a potential... Um, when I was sort of given the tests and the results came back and he emailed and uh, it's like, uh, 
I'm sure you get that reaction and it said, uh, congratulations, you, you know, you're in the top percent. I was like, Laura, I'm getting a job with MI6. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first reaction you get. <laughs> you're like, yes, this is it. <laughs> I mean, so, 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 uh, um, unfortunately, I, I, I think, so, I don't know, up to about 7 million people have, have taken our tests. And I, I doubt if we've found jobs for many more than a hundred. Um, it's, it's, you really do have to score something astonishing. And also most of the, most of the people who we have got jobs for have got skills in specific areas that, that people also want. It's, it's great being a super recognizer, but actually to be a super recognizer in policing, you need to understand the law. You need to know how to arrest people. You need to be able to get on with your workmates. You need to know how the system works. So, and actually the system working is far more important than your face recognition abilities. Very <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. As a final comment to wrap this up, um, are there any thoughts that you have you'd like to share with the listeners? Uh, well, anybody who wants to have a go at um, seeing if they might be a super recognizer, uh, I'm sure you're happy for my, my, the website to be shown. So it's www.superrecognizers.com. Um, and there's sort of a nice, easy test there. But to be honest, if you want to really find out if you're a super recognizer, you have to take a series of tests after that one and you can contribute to research and read read other things as well brilliant well josh thank you so much for participating i truly enjoyed talking to you off my first interview of the year so uh... oh, well, yeah <laughs> happy new year happy new year to you <laughs> and to everyone listening uh but thank you so much for doing this it's really exciting and maybe there'll be a part two uh in a few months or a few years uh when maybe you've you've, you've had some breakthroughs in the research but thank you so much and let's keep in touch brilliant. Thank you.